Hello and welcome to our today's live event. Hope you can hear me. So please let us know. Hi, Chrisa, can you hear me? I hope you can. Yes, I can, Caroline. Hi. Perfect. Happy to um, make sure that all is okay. And well, we are starting today with our online patient meeting and we are going to discuss and answer your question on yet another topic. I am your host as always, Caroline, of course, and uh, well, I am happy to be back here with you and I really do think this session will be interesting for you and well, I always want to remind you that we are here simply because we want to make sure that you can uh, learn and simply ask your question to the top fertility experts since right now you are not able to continue or start your IVF treatments. We just want to give you that opportunity to get ready to find out as much as possible what can be done on your case and well those events has been brought to you and they are brought to you thanks to our partners and ambassadors as well you can see them right here so as always i would like to thank them for their help and support uh, because as i mentioned it's not possible to to be able to do so many events without the help of those partners and ambassadors and uh, with us tonight is Chrisa Caracosta. Hi, how are you feeling tonight? Very well, thank you. It's nice to Perfect. be here and discuss with people. Perfect. And she is actually IVF lab director and patient manager at New Life IVF Greece. And she will um, discuss the topic on women over 40 and what are your options. Of course, she will be happy to answer any of your questions. And those questions you need to type in in the chat section. And uh, well, Greece. I will simply answer them for you. Before that, we will start with a short introduction from Krisa, and then we will go for most common questions. And right after, it will be your time for your questions. And well, that is it from me. Remember, this is being recorded, uh, and you will have a chance to rewatch it once again. And well, I think we can start. Krisa, are you ready to uh, begin? Yes, I am. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm going to start off by introducing myself. Uh, as Caroline said, I'm Lisa Caracosa. I've been an embryologist for the past 23 years. Um, I work at New Life IVF Greece. We're uh, an IVF clinic located in Greece and work with international patients for the past around seven, eight years. About 40% of our work is international. Um, so we do have the experience and I'll be able to discuss about those sort of matters as well. Um, nowadays, I've sort of left the lab and I head the international department. We believe that it was a good idea to have someone that had a strong background in IVF to head this department so we could be by our patients um, directly and sort of minimize the physical distance that we have with them and be able to answer to questions quickly um, and effectively. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you guys and thank the Stronger Together initiative. I believe it's a great initiative. It's a great way for patients to find out about uh, various matters that sort of occupy them and during this period of time. And hopefully when we're uh, post uh, COVID era, we can start treatments and be able to help them. I was asked to select the topic that we're going to discuss today and I, I chose the woman over 40, what are your options, because it's the number one sort of question that I get asked uh, through emails, through consultations with patients, because nowadays a, a large number of our patients are over 40. So why does this happen? It's mainly because we as women um, have children at an older age because we're seeking uh, a a proper partner for ourselves because we're chasing careers but because we start trying to have a family later on. So uh, why does this bring problems to us? Uh, the main reason is because as we age, our eggs age with us and because of this we have a, a huge increase in chromosome abnormalities. So when we're looking at women uh, at the age of 20 to 30, the percentage of chromosome abnormalities in their embryos is at the rate of 23%. While when we're looking at women 40 to 42, this percentage jumps up to 62%. And in women over 43, it goes to over 77%. So you can understand that the major reason that these women face problems are 
their eggs and the quality of their, their eggs. Um, there are things we can do and we'll be discussing that later on. But another thing that we see in these women is that we see a numerical drop in the number of eggs that they create. So if we in the lab get fewer eggs, we have uh, lower chances of, of getting good quality glasses and then being healthy. What are their options? Two mainly, own egg treatment cycles, but when we say own egg treatment cycles is to carefully um, see the ovarian reserve of a woman, select the proper protocol, select the proper medication, uh, individualize their treatment protocols, uh, perform only day five transfers because only then do we have the final assessment of an embryo. And also in some cases, we can also perform a pre-implantation genetic screening and test those embryos and make sure that what we're transferring are healthy embryos. If unfortunately all that fails, there is another option and that is the option of egg donation. Um, egg donation is a whole other topic also of discussion. We will touch on it today as well. Uh, it's performed in different ways according to the legislation of each country, but even within each country, each clinic has different ways of offering this. So it's very important if someone wants to have egg donation to do their homework, to make sure they understand what their options are, to see which option is best for them and what will give them the best success rates. Um, in women over 40 and as we age and even older ages than that, um, pregnancy risks exist. Uh, so we need to also be very careful not to just transfer three, four embryos to get a better uh, success rate because there are risks with multiple pregnancies. Women of an older age have high, higher risks uh, during pregnancy of developing gestational diabetes, of developing hypertension. So we as specialists and, uh, and doctors and embryologists also need to inform every patient about the risks and not just place many embryos to succeed. Um, all cases are different. Every case should be looked at individually. And I think that's how I'm gonna close this opening statement so we can sort of start the questions and we can uh, address all the options that you want me to talk about. Perfect. Thank you so much for that introduction, for uh, your for your explanation as well. Uh, huge thanks for that. And yes, it's let's start with those most common questions. And right after we will go for your questions. Remember to type them all in in the chat section. And the first question is: Forty too old for IVF? Absolutely not. 40 is not too old for IVF. The only thing that I'm going to point out is that if a woman um, starts to uh, have a child when she's 40, not to leave too long of a time before she does at least some initial testing. Because if there is an issue and you guys need to uh, perform uh, IVF, it's better to have it in your early 40s and, or than later on, because as I mentioned earlier, that there's a huge decline after the age of 43 due to the dramatic increase of chromosomal abnormalities in the eggs that we create. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And, and uh, next question is, what are the most important tests that one needs to perform so to evaluate, ev sorry, evaluate uh, the ovarian reserve? Okay, um, nowadays when uh, a patient contacts us, I usually request that it's good for them to have uh, a blood test for uh, AMH, anti-malarian hormone. This is a blood test that can be performed on any day of the menstrual cycle, and it shows us the dynamics of the woman, basically what her ovarian reserve is. Um, it's much better, it has more accuracy than the older hormonal profile that women used to perform like FSH, LH, estradiol, because it doesn't get affected by certain things. Um, and that's one of the tests. The second test that I believe is just as important is performing an ultrasound scan. This is a transvaginal ultrasound scan performed between day one to day four of a woman's menstrual bleed, and it's called an antral follicle count scan. This is important because it gives us more information. It shows us the number of follicles that exist in the ovaries, but also it's very important to look at the sizes. Um, it's important to look at the sizes because depending on some certain sizes, if a woman has two large follicles and very many small follicles, 
she needs to be pretreated before she starts stimulation because if we start stimulation without pretreatment then the big ones will grow very fast and the slow ones will never catch up the smaller ones will never catch up so it's very very important for us to also have this this image this scan to be able to select the best protocol for them. So these are the two main um, tests that a woman should perform to assess their ovarian reserve. Perfect, thank you so much for explaining this to us as well. And next question is up. Can PGS and GS improve success rates in all own egg treatment cycles in older women? I'll start off by just explaining what PGS is for people that don't know what it is. Uh, it stands for pre-implantation genetic screening and NGS is the latest technology that we, we use. It's called next generation sequencing. Um, it's a technique where we're able to check if the embryos that we have uh, are genetically normal or not. Um, this test used to be performed uh, or it can be performed on day three embryos or day five uh, embryos it's more accurate to perform it on day five embryos. It can help uh, certain women, and I do point the certain women. We need to carefully select on which uh, people we perform um, PGS testing. No, it's not suitable for everyone. Um, we need to be very careful because PGS as a technique has its downside, its disadvantages, because during, it's an invasive procedure, so we perform a biopsy on the embryo on day five, we zap it with a laser, we take certain cells and send those cells uh, for genetic testing. Um, studies have shown that five to 10% of embryos can be damaged during the biopsy, so we need to be very careful not to sort of say it to all because it may damage the one healthy embryo that a woman has. Um, sometimes we may not get a result from the PGS testing, uh, because the, the genetics lab has not been able to amplify the material that they've, uh, they've received from us. And sometimes we, we receive what's equivocal sort of results, which are the mosaic embryos, when an embryo has both healthy and unhealthy um, parts in it. And in those cases, these embryos can be used in certain cases as a second option. So yes, it can improve success rates in certain women, but these women have to be carefully selected. It, go, it all goes back to what I said initially, that each case is different. We need to individualize each and every case. Fantastic. Thank you so much once again for that. Um, next question is, what are the possibility, possible reasons for repeated fat IVF cycles in older women? Well, I'm going to start off by saying for every single IVF treatment cycle, there's two main parameters that um, lead to a successful cycle. 80% of it has to do with embryo quality and 20% of it has to do with endometrial receptivity. So when it comes to the embryo quality, the best way that we can possibly assess embryos is once we fertilize them in the lab to culture them to the day five stage. I know that there's a lot of clinics and doctors that say, well, you've only got two embryos, let's transfer them on day two or day three. But these embryos, if we transfer them so early on, we don't know their final assessment. We don't know if they're embryos that can implant. For an embryo to be able to implant, it has to get to the blastoff stage. Um, there's the fear. Um, there are only a few. What happens if they don't last in the lab and they don't develop to the blastoff? We nowadays have the technology to be able to, to create a blastocyst. So if an embryo is going to make it in the womb, it's going to make it in the lab as well. We have the, the good culture media, we have the technology, we have the knowledge. So I don't think that's a, a, an excuse not to take um, embryos to the day five stage. We as a clinic uh, take every single cycle to the blastocyst stage at this moment, even natural cycles where we only get the one egg. Um, it's, it's the best way to have the final assessment and find out reasons why um, certain uh, treatment cycles don't even reach an embryo transfer. I think it's, it's good for the patient if they don't have a, a proper uh, embryo to transfer, not to perform a transfer. Uh, I think when we're performing a treatment cycle, we need to also give answers to patients. We need to explain to them why it failed. Is it the egg's fault? Is it the sperm's fault? Um, do we see something in the lab? Uh, things like this can be uh, shown by the way that things develop in the lab. For example, 
um, the paternal gene, the sperm, the effect of the sperm on the embryo kicks in on day three. If you transfer the embryo on day three, they may be perfect embryos, but they may stop after day three. So we definitely need to take the embryos to the day five stage. Now, a possible uh, reason that we have repeated failures in IVF cycles may be chromosomal abnormalities in older women. Uh, many of the embryos that they have, despite that they look nice on day five, may be abnormal. This is something that unfortunately we cannot change. Um, it's something we have to face as older women, but it's something by at least taking them to the day five stage, we allow nature filters to stop certain chromosomal abnormalities. So we're transferring healthy embryos on day five. Uh, the other reason, as I said, for implantation failures may be poor embryo quality, not just genetically, but how an embryo looks morphologically in the lab. Uh, we see this sometimes. Um, the 20% uh, of the success has to do, as I said, with endometrial receptivity. Now, certain women um, also have a problem with receiving and, and accepting an embryo. Nowadays, in certain cases, we also uh, suggest that specific tests are performed. One of these is called the endometrial receptivity assay. And by performing this assay, we can see if an endometrial lining is receptive, but also time the embryo to the lining. It gives us information that's very important for a future cycle when we're performing a frozen embryo transfer. It's not for all, as I said, we have to individually individualize every single case. Perfect. Thank you so much once again for so many details on that as well. Next question is when should I start thinking of egg donation? Uh, huge topic again. Egg donation, um, a lot of the time is mistaken and is thought that it's only for older women. We always have to remember that egg donation is something that um, younger women also have to use in certain cases. We have women that have a premature ovarian failure. So I have had cases where uh, they're in their 20s and we still had to use egg donation. So that's one reason. Um, a second reason could be when a woman has a very diminished ovarian reserve. So if we see that their AMH levels are very low, that their antral follicle count scans are very low, if we try stimulating them and we don't get eggs, or if we do get eggs and they don't reach the blastocyst, so if we have uh, repeated uh, failures, uh, another reason to move on to egg donation if there's uh, a genetically transmitted disease that we need to bypass. Um, many failed pass treatments, of IVF treatments. Uh, it's, it's something that's used for many reasons and we, we have to, to, to use it in many cases. One thing I, I definitely want to point out though is I know it's the easy way out because it gives us high success rates, but emotionally it's the hardest uh, type of treatment for a woman to follow. Uh, one thing that we need to point out is that in women um, that have not decided that they're ready for egg donation, they can delay this because egg donation success rates don't have to do with the age of the woman. It has to do with the way a donor is selected and the age of the donor. So it's important to know this information because sometimes it puts your mind at ease. If you're still considering own egg treatment cycles, it gives you the opportunity to be able to um, follow those own egg treatment cycles through and then sort of move on to egg donation when you're ready. But again, I point out that it's very important to carefully select the donor. So you have to select a clinic that will do that careful selection for you. And also um, that you, you, you do it in a proper way, knowing all the facts. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that next question is how is egg donation run in greece okay egg donation in greece is anonymous so yes you're able to find out information about your donor uh, characteristics like heights and weights and hair color eye color ethnicity if they've had past pregnancy so you do get to find out a lot of information but you cannot identify the donor Neither can the child, when they turn 18, find out who the biological mom is. Uh, and, and the donor obviously cannot find anything about the recipients either. Um, in Greece, uh, according to the legislation, we're allowed to use uh, donors that are under the age of 35. 
Uh, at New Life, we have been able, because we have a, a large number of donors, to uh, drop that age to under 30, which means that we get better results. Um, the legislation allows us to use eggs in three different ways. It allows us to use fresh egg donation, frozen, or to do what's called egg sharing. Um, as New Life, we only use fresh egg donation cycles. This means that on the day that of the donor's egg collection, we will either have the husband here to produce a fresh sample so we fertilize the eggs, or we'll have a frozen sample and use that to fertilize the eggs. This means that we have the highest possible success rate because studies and sort of data that we have uh, when using frozen eggs shows that we have a 10% lower success rate. So why use them? Um, certain clinics use them because it's easier uh, to do it. It's, um, it's easier also to sort of split the eggs between recipients. Um, this is something that we do not do. We only use fresh egg donation cycles and the eggs of a donor goes, go exclusively to one recipient. This means that one patient gets a large number of eggs, which means they have a large, a good probability of getting good day five embryos. Um, not only just to transfer, but hopefully to freeze a surplus. And in the majority of cases, they're able to complete their whole family uh, through one donation cycle. Um, one uh, other thing that I'd like to say is that in Greece, the costs compared to many other uh, countries uh, are much lower. So that's another thing that's important to, to, to point out. Um, and the, the final thing that I want to mention, a new development that we have in Greece, it's actually very recent, is a central database of donors is, has been created. This has been a problem up until now in um, anonymous donation cycles due to data protection um, acts for the donor. Um, this is very good because it's able to track how many donations each donor does, not just at New Life, but to other uh, IVF clinics as well. And I believe it's going to help uh, generally sort of with traceability um, in the egg donation field. Excellent. Thank you so much for ma so many details again. And this will be our last question when it comes to those most common ones. And then we will go for your questions. There are plenty of those ready. So let's get to the uh, final question. How soon can I start treatment in Greece due to COVID-19 as I am worried that my fertility is dropping? I am very happy to say that Greece, because things have been going very well uh, with the COVID-19 situation, has um, uh, the restrictive measures have become a lot more flexible from yesterday. Uh, we have also been allowed um, to start treatment cycles. This is for Greek residents because uh, they're here. Um, we have implemented all the uh, restrictions and the regulations and the measures that the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology have suggested to us. Um, we're working very hard uh, to be able to implement and make everything safe for patients and our staff because obviously we want uh, staff members to be just as healthy to be able to treat our patients. At the moment, with international patients, we do have the issue of travel restrictions. We need to see when travel bans will be lifted, when quarantine measures will not be required when you do arrive in Greece, that hotels open, uh, all the logistics are sorted before we say to our patients, guys, great, you can start flyover. We're in constant contact with our patients on a daily basis. I receive many emails, I send many emails, I'm on the phone all the time because we definitely want to start treatments as soon as we can. We're hoping in the summer that this will be feasible, but obviously we need to wait for the situation to see how things are in order for everything to be safe. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for answering all those questions, those most common ones. And now it is time for your questions. As I've mentioned, there are plenty of those. So let's get to it. Uh, Risa, are you ready? I think so. I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic to hear that. Uh, let's get to it. Um, so, my daughter was due to have her egg donor treatment in Barbados on the 12th for, of this month. The day before she was due to have her pre-treatment, it was all cancelled due to COVID-19. She will be 50 on the 3rd of June and has missed her window. Is there anything she can do? 
obviously um, your daughter needs to speak to the Barbados Clinic and see if there's any uh, new changes uh, that the, the National Authority there has uh, stated about age. Um, here in Greece at the moment what they've stated for patients that have been having treatment with us and they were on that limit of 50 that we may possibly um, extend that period of, of treatment for a couple of months as soon as the, the, the restrictions are lifted. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not aware uh, what happens with new patients that are over 50. Uh, it's something that I would have to ask individually our national authority because I know that the regulation that they've stated exists for our existing patients that we have. Um, but as I said, I think the best thing to do is contact the IVF unit directly and ask them if they have news from their side. Exactly. Think, uh, I think that is always best, of course, but thank you so much for answering that question. Um, okay, next question is right here. I have been advised the HEA is good for fertility for women over 40. Could you explain more about that? Okay. DHEA and a lot of other supplements are always on the internet and I get a lot of questions. Does it help? Does it not help? There are some studies that show that the use of DHEA in older women may help increase their ovarian reserve by a very small margin. But in order for DHEA to have an effect, uh, we need to take it for at least three months, according to certain studies. And sometimes by delaying treatment for these three months, we may have a decline in the fertility. So my uh, recommendation is yes, you could start taking it. It will not harm you, but whether it's going to make a huge difference is debatable. I need to point out something that we state very often. Dr. Dovas, our medical director, states it a lot of the time in our consultations, that the IVF world is also an IVF business. If there was a miracle treatment that we can offer to people to improve their numbers, uh, improve their, their chances, trust me, we would all do it. Uh, I wish there were magic potions, lotions, treatments that we could offer to magically improve ovarian reserves, but unfortunately, they're not. We need to, to remember that the ovarian reserve may differ from month to month, so it's not just saying, I want to start treatment. We need to select the proper month to start treatment. So a woman on one month may have uh, an antral follicle count of three, while we've seen initially that a month before she had an antral follicle count of five. It's best to wait at least for a month or two to see perhaps that she has a better antral follicle count and better sizes before commencing treatment. Because in the lab, if we manage to get one or two extra eggs, it makes a huge difference to be able to get um, to the blastoid stage and have healthy embryos. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, you have talked about DHEA, but can you tell us something about ubiquinol as well? Many ladies read it starts with the egg. How much should we know? Who should we follow? As I said, there's a lot on the internet. I know the, 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 the specific book. I've been asked about it many, many times. Um, there are studies that state that they do help. There are studies that say that they don't help. Um, if it was something that was medically approved um, and a hundred percent, we would offer it to every single patient and say, definitely take it. It will not harm you. You can start on it, but I wouldn't put my bet on it. So I wouldn't start ubiquinol and DHEA and say, oh, I'm gonna, lay, I'm gonna delay my treatment for six months because this is gonna improve my results because it may not have that effect. So we need to be very careful because by delaying treatment sometimes in women that are over 40, women that are 42, 43, sometimes we may have the exact opposite result of what we're wishing for. Okay, thank you for clarify, clarifying that as well. Okay, next question is here. At 46 years, it is best for me to have an egg donor as I had a baby at 42, miscarriage at 45 years. What is best option, my own ex or donor? I have to be honest that at the age of 46, unless you have an extremely good ovarian reserve and we're able to genetically test your own eggs, uh, your own embryos once they're created, I would say your best option is to move to egg donation. Um, live birth rates at that age are low. 
Um, and we need to also look at what are the chances of you having a healthy pregnancy and not having miscarriages and things like that. Um, I would only suggest moving on to own egg treatment at that age if you have an extremely good ovarian reserve, some women do, and we're able to create a good number of blastoses, we're able to test them genetically and transfer a healthy embryo. Okay, perfect. Thank you again for this. Okay, there's another question. For women between 40 and 42, how many cycles of IVF in general do, you, do they need at your clinic? The whole IVF world has changed. Uh, in the past, we used to say uh, that we want to, um, you know, focus on cumulative pregnancy rate, rates and sort of do cycles and cycles. But nowadays, with the technology we have, the knowledge we have, what we're ideally uh, focusing is the time to pregnancy. So we're hoping that by carefully selecting treatment protocols, carefully giving the correct protocol to a woman, she, we will get the maximum out of the ovarian reserve she has be able to create good quality day five embryos and transfer very good embryos that hopefully will give her a good chance at a pregnancy. I nowadays don't see, um, like we used to see in the past, women doing eight, 10 uh, IVF cycles. Um, there isn't a specific number of cycles I can say uh, for a specific woman until we, we see her medical history. Sometimes we see um, women in sort of consultations where they've had um, cycles in the past and they're like, should I move to egg donation? Should I have own eggs? And when we see their cycles, we see that a lot of the things that we would like to have answers for have not been answered because they've had many um, transfers on day two or on day three where we don't know, does this woman create good quality blasts? Does she really have a chance of, of achieving a pregnancy? So really, um, it's a very broad question that you're asking. I would need to see your medical history. I would need to see your ovarian reserve. I would need to be able to know more information about you to say to you, yes, it's worth you doing one more treatment cycle or it's worth you doing two cycles or three cycles, depending on the results we have. And you can understand the suggestions we have for each patient varies and changes as we think, see things developing in the lab and in the IVF unit. So if we see a woman um, that she has very poor quality eggs, uh, we will say this to the woman, we will say this to the couple and explain to them that, guys, uh, really your chances are much lower than we were anticipating to see, and it's not worth you, you know, carrying on with own eggs, it's best to move to egg donation. Um, these are things that we need to see on an individual basis. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering yet another question. There are plenty of more coming. <laughs> so okay. let me get to the next one. How do you ensure safety with the pandemic? Okay. Well, the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology has given us guidelines on how uh, to move, uh, but also our national authority is giving us instructions about uh, safety measures. Obviously, all staff uh, follow, um, complete a, a specific questionnaire regarding um, how we move, how we act, how we live. Uh, do we have someone infected in, in our families? So we make sure, first of all, that, this, that the, the staff that's working is safe. We make sure that they don't have any symptoms that we should know about. If we see that someone does have symptoms, coughing or sort of a fever or something that's uh, related to, to the COVID uh, virus, uh, situation, we will put them, uh, we will stop them from working, so we will make things safe. We have um, split the IVF unit in a way in groups, so if certain members of staff do get infected, uh, that the unit will not stop and will not uh, stop working and offering treatment cycles. Um, visits to the IVF unit are only upon appointment for everyone, so only very small numbers of patients will be at the clinic at the same time. Um, there's uh, separate, separate designated areas in the IVF uh, unit where people will wait for their appointment, they will go straight in, they will be seeing specific people. Um, everyone's wearing masks, both patients, both staff. Uh, obviously, hand sanitization, um, as everyone should do. Um, there's things in the lab that we do. There's a whole list of things 
um, that we need to follow and regulations that we have. We have standard operation procedures that we've been put in place and we will be following throughout uh, treatment. When it comes to international patients, uh, we need to see, first of all, the guidance that we're going to have uh, from our um, health Ministry of Health um, to see what's going to happen with quarantine periods, and then we will be able to um, discuss. We are also in discussion, and it's very pos possible and probable, that we will need to test patients uh, for COVID before starting treatment. If someone uh, is tested positive, they will not be able to proceed with treatment. Um, because this is uh, done in order to make sure that everyone's safe. Um, there are specific algorithms that has been, have been set by the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology that we're following. There's a, a triage questionnaire that uh, patients will be filling out uh, two weeks before starting treatment, when they start treatment, during treatment. So there's a lot of stages and steps that we'll be following throughout this process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Again. It's going to make our, our lives much, much more difficult, I have to add. Yeah, that is true. But, well, we definitely need to uh, well, cope with it and do our best. Of course, right? of course, of course. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for explaining and providing all this, all those details on that. Definitely interesting and, well, um, definitely something we need to um, get used to as well. So next question is here. Is there a cutoff uh, regarding AMH level to do own egg IVF? I wouldn't say there's a cutoff. We need to see each individual patient because sometimes we do have women that despite having very low AMH levels, um, they still want to proceed with own eggs. Uh, we will in certain cases uh, follow stimulation protocols and sometimes we will do modified uh, treatment regimes in order to, to try and get one or two eggs. Sometimes we will even go naturally. I cannot say there's a cutoff of AMH levels. I, I need to see each patient's individual history to be able to say if it's worth pursuing. Uh, also, one of the things that we are very adamant on is we always um, give uh, a patient their risks, inform them of the risks. Um, so we tell them that, you know, there's a risk of cancellation, so and so, that you will not reach an embryo transfer, that you will not egg, 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 egg. So a patient is fully informed about what's happening. Now, an important thing to note is that AMH levels show us numbers. They don't tell us anything about the quantity. So it, you may have a younger woman um, that's 35 years old and she has a low AMH level and she's able to create two eggs after stimulation. Those two eggs, because she's of a younger age, are much better than, say, getting five eggs from a woman that's 45 years old. Because quality-wise, those eggs are going to be better. They're going to have a higher chance of reaching the day five stage and being chromosomally normal, and help, hence our success rates will be higher. OK, thank you so much once again for that. And can you please give us some thoughts and advice on tandem cycles? I am 44 and my last AMH test in November was 5.6. Um, two different topics. Uh, tandem cycles is something that we as New Life do not perform. So we will not run simultaneously a no neck treatment cycle and a donation cycle. Uh, one of the main reasons is because of the way we perform our cycles. All our donations, as I said, are not with the use of frozen eggs. It's used with fresh eggs. The reason being is because fresh eggs, when they're um, fertilized on the day of the egg collection, give you much higher success rates. Frozen eggs give you a 10% lower success rate. This can be seen from the uh, SARC, the American data. Um, also, our legislation does not allow us to transfer uh, an embryo created from donor eggs uh, and an embryo at the same time uh, created from own eggs. So we usually say to patients, it's best to finish a whole treatment cycle if that's what you want with your own eggs and then move on to egg donation. Um, now, regarding the AMH that it's 5.6, can I know what um, international units that's in? Is that in Picomoles and that? 
programs because otherwise I cannot um, have an idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. If you could just write this down for us too, so we can make sure. Um, okay, we can always get back to this. Yeah, uh, okay, question because otherwise, uh, please just let us know. Okay. Otherwise, Caroline, if um, Kat wishes, she can send me an email, and I'm more than happy to reply to her personally if if she doesn't know that at the moment. Okay? Yes, we can do it. Of course, no problem. So get back to us, uh, and we will be able to get back to you as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for that again. Uh, okay, so another question right here. Uh, you mentioned you use only day five. What if the embryo doesn't make it to day five? Also, what grades of these embryo are you looking for? Guys, nowadays we have the technology that if an embryo will make it in the uterus, it will make it in the lab as well. Um, as um, I will talk also as a business, when we decided to move on to performing only day five transfers, one of the things we had to consider as an IVF unit was, will we cancel many, many cycles? And is this going to be, uh, it's going to impact us financially as well. What we saw was that, no, there wasn't a significant uh, drop in sort of the number of uh, cycles we had or the number of transfers we performed. Um, the reason why we state that we only do day five transfers is because on day five, that's when we actually know the final assessment of an embryo. Even just to give you an example, even an egg donation, when the eggs are from a 23-year-old woman, a young age, uh, we may have 10 fertilized embryos. It doesn't mean that we're going to get 10 beautiful blastoses. On day three, we may have eight beautiful day three embryos some of these will stop developing some of these will not create good quality blastoses this is something really important to know because only a blastus will implant so it's very very important to get to the blastocyst stage also if we were able to perform chromosomal testing on day three embryos and day five embryos you would see that on day five we have lower number of chromosomal abnormalities because simply nature filters certain embryos that have these abnormalities. Nature is on our side. So why not use nature and filter those embryos and only transfer good quality embryos? I know it may mean that certain women may not have a transfer, but to be honest with you, the women that will not have a transfer because they do not have suitable glasses to transfer, they will never gonna get pregnant anyway. So why perform that transfer? I have that you know, two week, week wait, and why also pay for that transfer? At New Life, we're very adamant that you will only pay for the treatment that you have. So if a treatment cycle stops before your embryo transfer, you will not pay for an embryo transfer because you didn't have it simply. So these are very important to, to things to note. Now, the second part of the question says, also, what grades of these embryos are you looking for? Um, grading is, I'm an embryologist, and many, many times I get reports or emails from patients and they're saying, I have top quality blasts, and this is what I did. I ask them for photographs, and when I do see photographs, I do see different gradings compared to what the paper states. Um, grading is a very uh, uh, personal thing. Uh, we need to be very strict on the grading at New Life. Uh, we are very strict on the gradings that we have because Simply, we need to know what quality embryos a person creates in order to be able to guide them, not just for the cycle they're having now, but for future treatments. If a woman does not create good quality blastocysts once, twice, we need to tell her to stop. This isn't the right path. This isn't the right way. Uh, we're not here just to, to perform cycles upon cycles upon cycles. We're here to be able to guide people, to say, yep, this is the point where you need to stop. These are your chances. These are your risks of cancellation. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much about that and um, explaining this. And well, there is a follow up question to the previous one. Okay. Uh, okay. Unsure about uh, 5.6, but consultant did say normal range was 625. Thank you. Okay. So it's probably in Pico Malls from what I understand, and you had 5.6. So we're talking, sorry, I'm just looking at the different numbers. You're, we're talking about a low fertility, but as I say, as I stated, I need to really know 
apart from just your AMH, your medical history, know if you've had past cycles. Um, also, it would be great to see a natural follicle count scan. The scan is what I explained earlier when I started my uh, talk, uh, because that will show us not just um, the number of, of follicles that you have, but also the sizes. I need to point this out because sizes are also extremely important. Uh, many women sometimes send me an antral follicle count scan and we see seven follicles and they're great. I have a great reserve, but we see that four of these are of very, very small sizes. No matter what medications we give, even the best of combinations of protocol, even the best of medications, some of these follicles will not respond to treatment. So we need to be very careful on how we counsel our patients in order, so they understand what their true chances are, what, how many eggs we're expecting to get from a treatment cycle. Um, and that way they can weigh their options and see what's best for them. So I would suggest to Kat to perform a natural follicle count scan at the beginning of her menstrual cycle between day one to day four of her cycle and to let the sonographer, the doctor, know that you need to know the accurate sizes of the follicles as well. If, if people can have uh, images, that's great as well, because we can confirm the, the numbers that the, the, uh, the report states. And I'm more than happy if she sends these uh, things through, I'll be able to reply to her in a personal email and um, even offer a one hour free consultation where we can discuss her case in detail. Okay, excellent. Thank you again so much for that. Um, okay, there's actually a question about the grading of embryos. So uh, does the grading of embryo matter for better success? Of course, of course. Um, I need to point out that when we see embryos on day five at the blaster stage, there's two things that we need to keep in mind. One is the grading, so how an embryo looks. And we may have possibly... Uh, grade, M, grade A embryos, grade B, grade C, grade D. I'm trying to simplify things so people can understand. But also there's the genetic component. So I'm assuming the question um, is asking about the morphological criteria. Of course it plays a role because a, a top quality embryo has higher chances of it implanting. Uh, and sometimes I would say even higher chances of it being normal. On that one, I am going to be a bit not uh, adamant because I have seen sometimes through genetic testing that even uh, lower quality embryos can be genetically normal, but it can be, uh, yes, genetically normal. But yes, I'm going to be adamant that great grading does play uh, a, a significant role. Excellent. Thank you so much again for confirming that. And next question is, um, I'm 43 with early ovarian failure, FSH of 76. What is my best chance moving forward? FSH is not an accurate um, estimation. It's not the accurate way for us to see what your ovarian reserve is. But FS, an FSH of 76 is quite high, I would say. So I would be very, uh, I would say the best bet is to move to egg donation. Um, that would be my recommendation. But obviously, if you have more information uh, and you can sort of share that with us, it would be good for you to share it with us. But egg donation would be my, my first uh, suggestion. Okay. Perfect. And just to let you know, if you would like to get in touch with, uh, sorry, if you would like to get with the team and Krisa, uh, uh, you can also use this link and there is an option to ask your question and it will be forwarded to the team and I'm sure they will be able to get back to you with more details and possibly will also offer online consultation. That will be for sure helpful as well. It's Perfect. something that... It's something that we do offer uh, free. We offer a free one hour consultation. It's not uh, a consultation where we uh, advertise ourselves. It's a proper medical consultation. And this is why before we uh, set this up, we request if you have any past medical records, if you have any tests, we ask you to fill in a medical questionnaire. This is reviewed by our medical director, Dr. Dobas and myself. We head the international team. And we have a one hour consultation where we sit down, discuss your past history, your options, and try and give you our suggestions and recommendations. And we explain why we suggest this so you understand uh, what our reasoning and how we work. 
perfect sounds really really and uh, good to to know that and that it is offered for free as well for sure perfect thank you so much and um, next question is right here do you think that melatonin can improve the oocyte quality when taken in the month before stimulation what does your clinic use and is the those the slow release version work Emma, I'm going to get back to what I was saying earlier regarding DHEA and um, other supplements that I was asked about, that supplements, uh, there's, uh, there's studies that show that it can help, but studies that shows that it doesn't help. Um, melatonin has been shown uh, that sometimes it has a borderline improvement according to studies. Uh, but again, it's not going to work miracles. I need to point this out. Um, and I don't want people to delay their treatments uh, because they believe that supplements are going to change the world. It can have borderline sort of improvements, but it can't be 100% uh, good. Excellent. Thank you so much again for, uh, well, once again for reassuring and, I mean, just saying what is the, the real truth here as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, okay, now uh, let's have a look at the next question. What do you use for pretreatment to ensure follicles grow from a similar standing start and avoiding asymmetrical and even growth? Example, do you do estrogen priming? Now, um, in older women, we need to be, um, and, and generally in, in all women, we need to select the protocol properly. As I said, if we have uh, in an antral follicle count scan certain follicles that are large and certain ones that are small, sometimes we may go with the long protocol. So we start a down regulation regime about a week before the actual menstrual bleed, so to bring the follicles to the correct size. Sometimes we use estrogen priming. Um, so it differs from case to case. We've, we've used both. Um, it's also important to note that apart from the pretreatment, something very significant um to, to 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 note is that it's very important to um select the proper stimulation um, in older women where we have a lower ovarian reserve apart from fsh it's very important to also uh, use a medication that has lh lh primes the ovary to accept fsh so um, sometimes we use uh, menopure this has fsh and lh and we try and avoid uh, sometimes using just FSH, things like Gonaleth, because this is a better medication for women that are of younger age and a better ovarian reserve. Now, um, sometimes we also use antagonists during the luteal phase of the previous month. There's various things that we use. As I said, um, this is probably a question that is better answered by my medical director. He's the person that selects the protocol for each woman that um, sends us uh, their information and sort of decides to have treatment with us. And it's a very careful selection on an individual basis. And as I said, it's not just the protocol, it's also the month that we decide to commence treatment. So it doesn't mean that if you agree to have treatment with SK and we select the protocol X protocol that you will start next month and may, we may suggest don't start next month. It's not a good month for you to start. You need to start the following month because we see something in your ovarian reserve. Okay. Thank you so much for that um, advice as well and explanation. Next question is right here. At the age of 38 and AMH 1.07, what protocol you suggest for stimulation, mild one or a protocol with bigger doses? Again, my question will be what international units is the AMH measured in? Um, anyway, I will go on to, to answer this question, Olga. Um, there isn't, um, I don't believe in mild or bigger doses stimulation as such. I believe in balanced stimulations. Um, sometimes really high doses, we do see or see and hear protocols that patients have had and we hear of doses of 450, Sometimes I've even heard of 600 IUs. Nowadays, we don't use such high doses because studies have shown that such extreme high doses of medications don't really make a difference. There's a threshold up until where we should reach for FSH. Um, in, in these cases, we believe in a balanced stimulation, so we take advantage of the maximum that a woman can produce and be able to get those eggs in the lab. Um, I need to point out that if a woman, we see that on her antral follicle count scan, she has two follicles, 
even if I were able to give her two tons of medications, she's not going to create more than one or two eggs. So this is something to always have in mind. A lot of people believe that through IVF and through stimulation, we create more eggs. We don't. We take advantage of what each woman has. So the best thing for us to do is individualize everyone's treatment care and take advantage of the specific um, uh, 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 very, sorry, the, the, this popped up and it sort of blocked what I wanted to say. It, we need to take advantage of everyone's uh, specific ovarian reserve. Now it's in nanograms uh, and it was one point, um, sorry, Caroline, I forgot that it was 1.07. It's, it's low, but it's not very low. We need, we need to see the antrophologic account to be able to tell you what's the best protocol for you. I, I am going to say this again and again, just based on an AMH level, we cannot select a protocol because it may mean you have very small follicles and we need to advise you, these will not respond to treatment. We need to see the sizes to see if you'll be treatment. There's a lot of things we need to see. So the best thing, Olga, again, I'm going to say, as I said to a previous uh, person that asked the question, perform a natural follicle count scan. I know it may be an extra cost to you, but it's going to give you so much more information about your event reserve and what's the best way forward for you. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much again for this. Uh, there are more questions uh, coming up here. Okay, perhaps you can answer that one. I mean, uh, if you could provide your opinion. BGS has been downgraded, but H FEA in the UK has not enough evidence to suggest its success. If you uh, were listening how I started the discussion about PGS, I did say that yes, it can, it can improve certain success rates, but for certain women. It is an add-on, and yes, we agree certainly, and we were extremely happy when the HFEA created on their webpage this traffic light system and sort of um, said no to certain add-ons because it was getting out of hand with a lot of IVF clinic offering a lot of, a lot of add-ons that patients were paying and really were not getting much out of it. PGS should be used in specific cases. It should be used in women of an older age that have a large ovarian reserve, create a good number of blasts, and we want to limit the number of transfers they have, so we only do few transfers with healthy embryos. Um, the great thing, and I was going to keep this as a closing remark because I, I actually received an email today from a very good collaborator. Um, in the summer, there is going to be an announcement that it may be becoming routine to be offering what's called non-invasive PGS testing. Nowadays, the PGS testing that we're using is invasive. So as I explained earlier, we zap the embryo with a laser, we take cells, so we may be damaging the embryo. We have a 5 to 10% chance of damaging the embryo. So if a woman only has two embryos, we're very, you know, it's risky to go and perform a PGS testing on it because we may get one healthy embryo and that may be the embryo that gets damaged. In the summer, uh, they're still waiting for final uh, testing on the accuracy they will be launching what's called non-invasive PGS testing, PGTA testing. How will this work? In the culture media that we culture the embryos, we'll be able to take the culture media, send that for testing without touching the embryo, and that fluid will be tested and will give us information and will be able to give us uh, accurate sort of information if it's uh, an embryo that's normal or not normal. If that's launched, and if it has the accuracy that we want and we're able to implement it in routine um, IVF treatment cycles, I, I think it's going to be the future. I think it's going to save a lot of women from unnecessary uh, transfers and it's going to give us better results. Okay, definitely sounds promising. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. That's definitely interesting. Okay, um, now question, next one is, uh, I have very low AMA, 0 0.2, no information about what you need, but I uh, hope you can answer. And two fat IVF cycle, should I seriously consider egg donation? And I'm 43. I believe that egg donation would be your best option. Um, it would give you much higher success rates. I need chance to sort of give you an idea about success rates, just so you understand what we're talking about. In women aged 
42 and above success rates are much lower. Uh, new life success rates are slightly above 20% in women aged over 42, but this is in a highly selected population, in women that can create eggs, in women that do get to the, the blast stage, and we do perform test and transfers. In egg donation, when we transfer to day five top quality blasts, we have a positive pregnancy rate of 68%. So you can understand these are worlds apart. Um, I believe that egg donation would give you the best success rates, uh, but obviously if you're not ready for it, we need to look at your past five failed IVF cycles, see why these failed and see if there's any room to improve this result. But if you ask me um, what my suggestion would be, yes, it would be to consider egg donation. Okay, perfect. Thank you again for answering this question. Next one is uh, right. Keep coming, I see. <laughs> yes, lots of those. <laughs> okay, so let's get to it. Um, how long in advance should I prepare for cycle? Does no alcohol diet, etc., make that much a difference of nearly 43? Can we do anything to improve or is it now luck? Rachel, uh... Preparing for an IVF cycle is like preparing for a pregnancy. You need to imagine yourself as if you're pregnant. Would you like to enter a pregnancy being overweight? Uh, overweight? No. It's best to go on to a diet if you're overweight, lose weight, uh, have a healthy BMI, because we're really preparing our bodies for pregnancy. Um, all Everything that affects uh, our healthy lifestyles, like alcohol, smoking, yes, it should be stopped. The earlier you stop it, the, the, the better it is for you. But there isn't a time frame to say one month, two months. Uh, I believe that we should, when we're trying for a baby, we should lead a healthy lifestyle. We should follow a healthy lifestyle, uh, proper food, proper exercise, try and limit alcohol, uh, obviously cut smoking, um, be as, uh, do everything we can to prepare our bodies for a pregnancy. Okay, thank you so much again for that. And uh, next question is quite a long one, okay? So, and there's a follow-up to it as well. So let me just show you this. Okay. I am 44, uh, 45. Over the last seven years, we had nine on egg IVF cycles, around 14 embryo transfers from these cycles with implantation only once five years ago. Unfortunately, this ended in a missed miscarriage. Since then, I have had aqua scans and hysteroscopy and basic immune blood tests, Chicago tests with no real issues showing, slightly raised NK cells, but not major, and my clinic treats empirically uh, with steroids anyway. Last year, due to my age, we moved to donor egg cycle, which gave us six excellent good quality embryos, all frozen. From this, I have had two transfers, but both negative. Should I have any other tests before transferring the next embryo? I feel there is something else wrong since two top quality young donor egg embryos have not worked. And uh, in follow up to my previous question, should have mentioned that I also had ERA tests which came back as receptive at the standard five days of progesterone. Okay, so just by the last comment that you said, they were day five embryos, just to clarify, Caroline, because you didn't change the slide and I'm trying to follow things through. Sure, just let me go back. Uh, yeah, one AA blastocyst each time. That's what you mean? Okay, yes. Okay, um, my comment on this one is to hang in there um, because you've only transferred two embryos. They are uh, donor embryos, yes, which means that if the clinic that you had treatment with selected the donor properly, she was of a young age, um, you know, all the proper selections, that these embryos are of good quality, uh, I would just pursue further treatments. You've only transferred two embryos. Um, with, at our clinic, just to give you an example, with the first transfer, say if we transfer two top quality blasts, we have a 68% uh, chance of, of having a successful uh, outcome. But cumulative pregnancy rates, if we have three transfers in total, goes over 90%. So you can understand the way forward in your case, since you've created so many good blastocysts, is to move forward with further transfers. You've got the error results, follow them properly. And I believe further transfers will get you to that 
uh, a positive outcome. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that advice. Uh, the only addition is that the patient wrote 21 year old and proven donor those were so Sound, sounds very good to me make sure that the quality of the embryos is very good um, if possible uh, obtain information about the blastus not just um, blastus AA or try and get photographs of the embryos just so you confirm that indeed the blastus that you're transfer are top quality because sometimes um, clinics do uh, freeze embryos that are of lower quality uh, patients believe sometimes that they're top quality, they're not, and this is something significant in order for you to know in your history and also know what your chances are. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much again for that uh, advice here. Okay, at the age of 40, how many eggs with own eggs are recommended? Done three so far and have read statistics that the cumulative success rate increase uh, till, until six, but then there is only a limited likelihood from there on. What happens with treatment cycles is we do get an increase in the success rates uh, due to cumulative pregnancy rates and the number of embryos we transfer, but at some point they do reach a plateau. Uh, I believe uh, we start reaching a plateau after three to four treatment cycles, but I need to point out that you need to let me know or you need to check how these ICSI cycles have been performed. So yes, you performed three um, cycles so far. Did you do day five transfers? Um, do you know what sort of quality embers you were transferring? Because if you tell me that you've performed three ICSI cycles and they were day two or day three transfers, we really don't know if you've actually failed because um, something else is wrong or if it's the embryo's fault. We don't have that information. There's a big question mark there. We don't know the final assessment of the embryo. So that's the important thing to do. Okay, excellent. Thank you again for that. And uh, what do you mean precisely by, by carefully selecting the donor? Um, I will s explain to you a bit about the criteria that we select donors, just so you understand this. Um, a donor, first of all, needs to be of a young age. As I said, the Greek Nash, um, legislation states that donors should be under the age of 35. We've been able to minimize this, to drop it down to under 30. Uh, this means that we're getting better egg quality, uh, healthier embryos from chromosome abnormality rates. Uh, it's good to do um, testing on them to make sure that they're healthy, that they don't have anything. We also do genetic testing on them. We do karyotype testing to make sure that there isn't something that will come up later. We like to use what's called proving uh, uh, fertility uh, donors so that they either have a pregnancy of their own or uh, not necessarily that it's led to a baby, but we know that they've had a pregnancy. We need to make sure that they don't have any gynecological problems themselves, like a woman that has endometriosis should not become a donor. Um, so these are the things that we need to carefully select. Um, there's a huge profile of things that we do apart from um, testing and seeing them gynecologically. We also need to see character things, make sure that they're leading a healthy lifestyle. All of these things go into place before selecting a donor. Okay, again, thank you so much for this. Mm -hmm. And now let's get to the next one right here. I am nearly 40 and doing this a single lady. AMH is 8.28, AFC is 8. I've had three rounds of IVF ICSI. Poor responder only had three to five eggs. They fertilize but no, do not reach blastocysts. Is there anything I can do to improve quality? I've used two different donors and done short, long, and mild protocols. Do we have, Helen, any information regarding what happens in the lab the first couple of days? So uh, where is the problem? Has your IVF lab um, given you information? Is the, the, the egg quality poor? Um, is, um, the, do, do the embryos stop on day one, on day two, on day three? All of this information is really important to understand where the problem lies. Um, also, you do state you have an antrophological scan of eight. Um, what are the sizes of these follicles? Have you indeed been given the correct protocol? I know you've used the short, the long, the mild protocols, but it's not just selecting the protocol, it's how it's used and how uh, the doctor selects the month that you start treatment to take advantage of your, your um, antrophological counsel. 
I would say because you've had three rounds of IVF, the best thing to do is for us to review your medical history if you'd like. I'm more than happy if you send your past records to the clinic for us to fill out a medical questionnaire and have a consultation with you to let you know, is it worth trying again? Is there anything we can improve uh, from our side, either through the stimulation or anything that we can do in the lab to improve things? Uh, but we need to first see where the problem lies in your previous cycles to be able to comment. Okay, thank you so much. And again, remember, you can just simply provide more details uh, to, to with the link I have sent to you. And I'm sure Chris and her team will be able to provide you with, again, more details. So and I know I'm be sorry. Able to help you. I'm sorry that sometimes I cannot be more specific to your questions and give you accurate answers. But a lot of the time we need to take a step back and see everything, analyze everything make sure there hasn't been small things that we can change that will make the whole difference in the whole treatment cycle. And I believe that's perfectly okay, you know, because that way you will be able to just simply uh, evaluate the whole uh, medical history and you will be able to really help. So that's, that's good for sure. Okay, um, can you have a look at this one? Uh, again, there, are not, there is no much uh, details. However, I had an AFC scan last year on cycle day three, but they didn't see any eggs. What does this mean? I'm 40. Um, my first question would be, who performed your antral follicle count scan? Was it someone that knows how to perform antral follicle count scans? Um, because sometimes we do receive scans that we see follicles and the doctor says no follicles. So uh, number one, where did you have your antral follicles count scan? But also to confirm this result and make sure that this is an accurate result, I would say why not just perform a, a blood AMH result uh, that will show us what your ovaries are, or how they're working, and will give us more information and be able then to guide you what to do. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much again for that um there is a question about gender selection i know in greece it's not possible but uh, anything you could add my wife is 38 i'm looking forward to have a baby by pgd um as as you very correctly said caroline P uh, gender selection in greece is prohibited i would say if you're interested in such type of treatment get in touch with egg donation friends i know they collaborate with certain countries that do offer such treatments and they'll be able to better guide you guys. Yes, that's exactly the thing. So if you would like, just simply drop me an email um, and I'll be happy to, to provide you with some details as well. I will send you an email in a few minutes as well. Uh, but in the meantime, let's get to the next question. If you have reached blastocyst stage, but implantation was unsuccessful, is this a good sign to do IVF again? If you have done, Gina, uh, a treatment cycle and we see that you do create a blastus or blastus um, and just that you're unsuccessful the first time around, yes, I would say that very possibly it's a good sign to have IVF again because it means that your body can create blastuses and it just may be simply that the one blastus or the two blastuses that you transferred were unfortunately chromosomal abnormal. abnormal. Uh, this does happen in older aged women and we just need to persist because hopefully by transferring a further blastocyst or blastocyst we will get to the result that we want so yes stage it's a, a happy event because it shows us that your embryos can get there okay perfect thank you so much once again uh, again you have answered that anything you could add donors embers anonymous or can child get information when they turn 18 in greece uh, egg donation is anonymous and no children will not be able to get information when they turn 18. even if the legislation changes in the in the future in greece for uh, whatever reason this will not work retrospectively so whatever treatment cycles are performed now they will, the, the legislation will apply to them in the future too. So it's totally anonymous. You do, however, find out a lot of information about the donor. You cannot see pictures, but you get information about uh, characteristics, about sort of uh, the age, the ethnicity, um, hair color, eye color, whether they're right-handed, left-handed. I personally um, take 
part in the matching process uh, for the donation cycle. One of the reasons that I'm very close to patients from the beginning of this process uh, of egg donation, uh, from the very first uh, Skype consultation, is because I love to get to know uh, the people that we're going to treat. It helps me in making the best selection for them. I wish that I can have a patient online now that has had egg donation to be able to explain to you how we perform this matching process. And because they, they, they have the end result at home, a baby at home, they would be able to explain to you that this is something I take very personally and my clinic takes very personally because we believe in it. We believe that it's not just creating an embryo, we're creating families and we need to pay a lot of attention to this. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. And so is there a waiting list? Is there an issue with being single? How much does it roughly cost? Okay, um, lots of questions. So there isn't a waiting list for donor um, eggs. I, I don't know if you mean donor eggs or donor embryos. I will clarify this in a second. There isn't a waiting list as such, but we do need usually two to three months to, to find the perfect match for you and be able to uh, perform the treatment cycle. Because first of all, we need to recruit someone that looks like you, that matches your blood group, uh, that has the requirements that you will request in a specific form that you uh, will fill. Um, now, there is no issue in being single. In Greece, we are allowed to perform um, treatments in single women. The only thing that they need to do extra is sign a specific notarial deed. We organize this here at the IVF unit. Um, and this is basically uh, something that the legislation has put in place in order to protect the unborn child. Um, egg donation. Now, in your case, because you're single and you'll be using donor eggs and donor sperm, uh, a lot of clinics use donor embryos that are left over from past treatment cycles. At New Life, we do not use uh, donor embryos left over from past treatment cycles because these will these are leftover embryos, so they may possibly give you lower success rates. We go on to create embryos for you, so a specific donor that you will we will select together, uh, an egg donor will be selected for you, and we will select together again a specific sperm donor, and we will create embryos for you. This means that you end up having a good number of day five blasts, so you have a very high chance of succeeding, but uh, many times having many surplus embryos in order to have baby number two or number three and not have to have further cycles. Uh, the cost of an egg donation cycle in Greece is 6,000 euros, and this um, is a total package cost. The only thing it doesn't include is your medications and your preliminary tests. Um, and then the sperm commences, the donor sperm commences from 250 euros and above, depending on the type of sperm we select. Um, these are the rough costs. I'm more than happy, Helen, to send you an email with all the breakdown costs and the explanations so you're able to understand everything. Perfect. Thank you once again for, um, for, that, for answering that question. Uh, okay, next question is up right here. I froze my eggs at 38 and am now 48 and looking to use my eggs but have to transfer them abroad to use them. Should I carry the embryo or would it, better, would, be, would it be better to use a surrogate? I'm finding it difficult to find a clinic which can transfer an embryo on a woman over 50 just in case I can't do a transfer for some time due to the, the virus. And my first or subsequent attempts are unsuccessful. Um, where would you recommend? Do you know any countries where it is actually possible? Um, over 50 uh, at the moment, I, I personally don't. I don't know which countries allow this. I assume this is something, Caroline, that you're more uh, knowledgeable to than I am. Again, it's possible for, for me to just uh, help you out with it. Just drop me an email yeah. and we can definitely uh, but, get in touch. But I would like to say to Susan that um, if uh, even at the age of 48, if there's no issues with her uterine cavity, uh, even if she stopped menstruating, we can still uh, create an artificial cycle, get the uterus back in shape. Indeed, she will not need to use a surrogate. She can go on and carry on uh, with the pregnancy herself. Yes, she needs to take into account that older women have higher risks uh, during pregnancy, as we explained, high risk of gestational diabetes, hypertension. 
but I don't believe that um, she would need a surrogate if her uterine cavity is fine and there's no abnormalities that would prevent a pregnancy. Um, I would suggest that she carefully selects the clinic where she transfers eggs. It's sometimes difficult um, because a lot of clinics have the problem of shipping eggs and receiving eggs and what is the quality of the eggs because uh, there's many issues with that. Um, it's something she'll need to see and carefully select. But she's got two years ahead, so she shouldn't be thinking that the COVID virus is going to have such a, a long-term effect. I believe things will be sorted much sooner than that. Okay, perfect. Thank you again for that. And as I mentioned, you can just drop me an email and be happy to help you out as well. Okay, and uh, next question is right here. I am 43 next month and have had six consecutive sorry, miscarriages over the last three years from natural pregnancies. Are you able to help investigate in case, cases of recurrent mass miscarriage before IVF? Would we be able to also use IVF with PGS? Okay, have, the first question I would ask Leah is, has she performed any um, tests for miscarriages? The main risk for miscarriages are, number one, chromosomal abnormalities. In the age of 43, yes, chromosomal abnormalities are high in the embryos. So we're talking about over 75% of embryos will carry chromosomal abnormalities, and that's the number one cause of miscarriages. The second thing that we would investigate uh, is possibly, if this hasn't already been done, is blood clotting issues. So is the blood that leads into the uterus clotting more easily than it should do? There's a, a, a what we call a thrombophilia panel of tests that we suggest. Uh, this will indicate if there is such an issue. If there is an issue, what we use is low molecular weight heparin in order to prevent this from happening. Blindly using low molecular weight heparin does not help. Studies have shown this, and these are the guidelines that we have from the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. So not all women should just treat, should be using low molecular weight heparin in all cycles. We see this in, in many cycles, and they shouldn't be used because the use of low molecular weight heparin does not help with implantation. It only plays a role in miscarriages and only to the women that do have uh, an abnormality in their thrombophilia pa panel. The third reason for miscarriages, main reason, is structural abnormalities of the uterus. So I assume after so many consecutive miscarriages, um, the uterus has been screened. Um, nowadays, we do not need to do uh, invasive procedures like hysteroscopies. Uh, there is very accurate three-dimensional scanning that we can perform to visualize if there's any abnormalities. If we do detect something, yes, indeed, then hysteroscopies may be needed in order to, to uh, um, solve the problem. So these are the th three main risks that we need to uh, assess and, and, and see. There is a, a fourth category, uh, which are immunes. Uh, it's a very controversial area. Um, there are studies that have been performed that show that they do play a role. Um, however, there is no accurate testing and the treatments that are offered for such uh, issues do not seem to play a role. Again, the guidance that we have from our societies uh, is that immune should be only offered, immune treatment should only be offered under a research institution uh, because uh, there's no medical evidence um, to back it up as yet. Yes, uh, if Leah has a good enough ovarian reserve, and we are able to have embryos uh, at the day five stage and it's worth us doing it without risking things, PGS would be an option. Okay. But again, uh, Leah has also added right here, I knew some details, more details. Mm -hmm. Only one loss was tested, blood clotting issues tested and protein was found. I've been on LMWH and aspirin for the last three pregnancies. And yes, I have had hysteroscopy and MRI, which has only just detected adenomyosis. Um, Leah, you said that only one was tested embryo. I guess, was that a, a, an abnormal embryo? Um, can you give us some backup? I can see someone's typing. I assume it's Leah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So let, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it was abnormal T18. Okay. It is very possible, I have to admit, that as I explained to you, over 75% of the uh, miscarriages that we have are due to chromosome abnormalities. So it is very possible that there is that issue. Have you and your husband performed karyotype testing on yourselves? Because yes, an older woman has higher chances of having chromosomal abnormality due to her age, but we also need to assess that there is an underlying condition. I could just see she's just typed something. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up. Um, yes, yes, both okay. So, so um, since there's no other underlying conditions, so there isn't a, an abnormal karyotype that would make these chromosomal abnormalities even higher, uh, then we're facing the, the high chromosomal abnormality rates due to her, her age. We need to assess her ovarian reserve. We need to see if there is something that we can do that would help us through PGS. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again for a very detailed uh, question and your help with it. And we will be slowly finishing, okay? So uh, there are more questions for sure. So I would like to let you know that we will definitely get back to you. Uh, I will simply forward those questions to uh, to Krusa and her team, okay? Um, I believe this will be our last question for tonight as we definitely need to finish. As you know, we do have another webinar coming, so uh, we just, we need to do it. Okay, uh, next question then, it's right here. Do you offer surrogacy as well? What is the cutoff age for uh, intended parents in Greece? And what is the legal situation? I am Greek born, but my husband is British Australian. Okay, surrogacy is indeed allowed in Greece. There are specific uh, issues with surrogacy, meaning that uh, the surrogate that we use needs to be uh, a, a resident in Greece. The difficulty uh, that we have as a clinic is finding surrogates. The reason I state this is because uh, finding donors is easy and we can monitor them and um, vouch, I'll put it this way, for what they do and how they act and how they are during the donation period. With surrogates, it's a huge obligation because there's no way we can monitor a woman and what she does throughout pregnancy for nine months. Um, now, nowadays, what we say as a clinic is that if a woman has their own surrogate, obviously a resident of Greece, that they were, we're more than happy to help her um, get all the paperwork ready, uh, create the file, because in order for us to proceed to a surrogate case, we need to get a court order to allow us to do it as a clinic. Uh, it's something that we're working on and we're hoping that in the near future, we'll be able to have more surrogates on, on, on board in order to be able to offer it to all our patients. But at the moment, it is a difficult situation. I'm not negative to, towards it, so I would say to Angela, to send me her details and if a surrogate does arise and I'm able to help her, I will help her. Excellent. Thank you so much once again for your explanation. Uh, as I mentioned, we um, we do need to finish. However, uh, let me just go for the one more question, okay? It should be a short one, quite a short one. You're welcome, Angela. Okay, <laughs> perfect. What are the chances for a woman who is 40 years old as I am to have a successful IUI with a sperm donor? As I am to have a successful IUI. Okay, um, the reason, the way I started my discussion was uh, to the question, am I told at 40 to have a child? No, yes, you can go forward and have a successful IUI uh, at the age of 40, but I would be very, very careful not to lose a lot of time with IUI treatment cycles. The reason I say this is because usually success rates with IUI treatments are low. Um, in order for us to be able to get the success rates of one IVF treatment cycle, we need to have a block of four to six IUI cycles. Um, so the chances of IUIs at that age are 12 to 15%. So you can understand in order to get the success rate we get with a single IVF treatment cycle, it takes time. International IUI treatment cycles are not recommended. So if you live in the UK, for example, I would not recommend that you go abroad to have IUI treatment cycles because the cost gets higher and higher because you have to travel over more. You have a lot of things. It's not just done in one cycle. Um, 
I would assess your ovarian reserve, make sure that you have a good ovarian reserve if you're trying for IUIs, because by losing time to do that block of four to six IUIs to get to a possible pregnancy, you may lose valuable time. That is very, very important for IVF because if you have lower numbers in IVF, we have lower success rates. If you get older, we have lower success and higher miscarriage rates. Excellent. Thank you so much. As I mentioned, there are some questions that haven't been answered, but as we need to finish, uh, well, all I will do is just simply forward your questions to the team. And I am 100% sure that they will get back to you with more sure. details. Perfect. Thank you so much, Krisa. This has been very interesting. Lots of useful information. Uh, as you see, lots of questions as well. And well, thank you so much all to all of you for joining our event tonight and well, for all your questions as well. Uh, so <laughs> this is uh, great that you are um, well here with us. And as you can see, Krisa, there are some comments right here. Thank you so much for such informative for informative information this call has been so valuable and there are more of those thank yous here thank well. you I, I, I would like to say to everyone thank you don't give up there are new developments there are answers there are solutions you just need to properly prepare and we're going to be by your side every step of the way Perfect. That's just like a perfect summary, that's for sure. Uh, so yes, best of luck, of course. Uh, there are more of those coming. So um, as I mentioned, we will have another live event uh, in less than 30 minutes. So I hope you can stay tuned with us and just join our next webinar uh, again. That has been great, Risa. Thank you so much for joining thank our you. initiative. It is really good to have you here with us tonight. And uh, well, have a lovely evening. And to all of you, once again, remember that this has been recorded. You will still have a chance to, to re-watch it. It will be uploaded uh, on our site uh, within the next few days. And don't forget to follow us on YouTube channel. And that way you will be updated once the uh, video is uploaded as well perfect thank you so much thank again you. thank you so much and take care, care. Stay safe, bye. guys